This is Rob Johnson, President of the Institute for New Economic Thinking. I'm here today with an old friend and mentor, colleague on congressional staff, Jamie Galbraith, who has been a professor for many years at the LBJ School at the University of Texas in Austin, done a tremendous amount of work on inequality, on the role of the state, modern monetary theory, you name it, he's got a perspective on it, and usually a very fresh and innovative one. And as you know, the Institute for New Economic Thinking is meant to foment critical discourse, and he's a key ingredient, always has been since our inception. So in Texas, you've just been through uh, what you might call a vivid breakdown in the infrastructure of the social system, and how would I put it? I'll bet you guys had a big run to the sporting goods store to buy hockey skates and things like that. Uh, what what yeah. happened in Texas? What 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 really broke the electrical system and the hospitals and everything? What what broke this the system was the uh, structure of the electricity market as established by free market economists, including uh, one in particular who took credit for the design, a guy by the name of Professor William Hogan of the Kennedy School at Harvard, mm -hmm. uh, who was quoted in the New York Times reportedly saying that the system was working as designed. And I think he was right. Uh, it was working exactly as it was designed. It was designed uh, to the benefit of the generating companies, to the benefit of the uh, fossil fuel companies, and to the benefit of the politicians that they funded. Uh, mm -hmm. And we had a mythology of uh, free market competition. And what Texans learned was, what does that mean in practice? What it means in practice is that without regulatory uh, standards, uh, the generating companies try to do everything on the cheap. Uh, and so they don't weatherize um, because after all, Texas is warm most of the time. And a hard freeze like this maybe happens once a decade. So, mm -hmm, you mm -hmm. know, the nine years and 51 weeks out of the decade, uh, they get away with it. Uh, but then that one week happens when they don't. And uh, when they don't, two things happen. Uh, one, one is that you, you get an increase in demand because demand is extremely inelastic. Uh, it doesn't respond to price, but it does respond to weather. Uh, and secondly, you get a collapse of supply uh, because the, the the equipment freezed up, uh, mm -hmm. froze up, mm -hmm. uh, and that was mostly na uh, natural gas, some uh, renewables as well, but mostly natural gas, all of which could and should have been weatherized because uh, obviously most of the country knows how to weatherize electrical equipment. Chicago doesn't freeze up in a bad storm. Right. Right. Uh, uh, so it's not like it's rocket science. It just wasn't done because the companies didn't want to do it because, and they weren't made to. And the result of that, since electrical demand and supply have to balance, it's not a question of the prices making them balance, they have to balance. When the supply falls off, they had to cut everybody out. Uh, and then there's another problem. Then you go over to what is essentially necessarily a kind of socialist uh, allocation of the supplies. Uh, that tells you you have critical infrastructure, Crit hospitals in particular. And they tend to be concentrated. I happen to live right amongst a bunch of hospitals. And so my electric lines stayed live. I didn't lose power because I share lines with hospitals. But the fact that I had that good fortune meant that many people in the city didn't get power back at all for days, days and days, mm -hmm. 60 mm -hmm. hours, from four days sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, and if you don't do that and the temperature is between 10 and 20 degrees or below 10 degrees Fahrenheit, your pipes freeze. And so enormous costs, destruction of people's homes, uh, and just damage, water damage, uh, as well as the psychological damage, and in some cases the physical damage is simply being dark and cold and hungry, uh, uh, was uh, inflicted on people as a result of this system. Uh, yeah. It was an absolutely yeah. textbook case in how free markets break down if there's not adequate regulation. And the uh, context of the lockdown and the pandemic, where what you might call the anxiety is already at the top of the charts, that, that makes it very, very dis disorienting and, and it, the, the pandemic certainly discovery. complicated things to a, to a degree. It, I'm sure yeah. that's true. Uh, uh, but I have to say, I, 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 I was impressed by the extent to which people were prepared to step out and take risks. Uh, the or response of ordinary people was really, mm. really remarkable. But 
you know, you are just talking about a lot of people who, are, who have no place to go and huddled mm -hmm. in the dark. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Now, uh, we talked a little bit earlier just about the themes mm -hmm. related to inequality and their cause, but mm -hmm. the inequality in the access or the quality of health care is another theme that we hear a lot about these days. In, uh, is that just he who has money can buy or what, what's, the, what's the nature of the challenge, especially when, uh, how would I say, you being infected harms me. There's a, there's a profound externality sure. in this system. What do we need to do to put things on a better platform, both from a humanistic point of view and a recognition of our interdependence? Well, one, one way to look at this is to uh, ask about which countries handled this pandemic uh, effectively and which did not. Mm -hmm. uh, and what you find, of course, is that the countries that did, um, and some of them are socialist and some of them are capitalist, uh, but what they had in common was a, that they had maintained public health uh, capacity. Uh, mm -hmm. So they were ready on the first day, which was like the 3rd of January when the r first reports came in, they were ready to close their airports, they were ready to mobilize uh, you know, cabinet committees uh, and to set up, set up protocols for, for, for acting on this. That was true in, uh, it was true in um, uh, Korea, it was true in Taiwan, it was true in Singapore, Hong Kong, it was true uh, in, on, within a few days in, the, in mainland China itself. Um, mm -hmm. It's true in Vietnam. Uh, and those countries actually suppressed the virus, New Zealand, um, mm -hmm. Did too. Do a great job. And then you yeah. have the then you have the countries uh, which are wealthier, by and large, uh, like ourselves, the British, uh, and some of the Europeans, uh, where the healthcare system is uh, highly structured to the kinds of ailments that rich people, rich populations have: chronic diseases, diabetes, uh, heart diseases, and so forth. And does not that where the public health element was very very run down. People, you know, public health was a very minor piece of medical education. The funding for it was, 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 was cut. The preparatory committee in the White House had been dissolved. Uh, and so they had nothing to offer uh, except turn it over to a very decentralized system of governors and mayors to try and manage uh, and um, call on private corporations to do what they could. Uh, and um, and they, the, the thing fell apart. And so we got, we got clobbered. And the best we could do was to keep it from being, keep it from going to the whole population all at once. Uh, but we couldn't, we, we, we could only slow the spread uh, and lost a half a million people so far, uh, waiting for the vaccines to come and, and, and put an end to it. Uh, a terrible uh, example. Uh, so what we need to do is to realize that we're not immune from public health crises, and we need to have a public health service. Um, now, the other issue that you were talking about is paying for people's health care. That's, a, of course, another separate issue. And obviously, we need to have uh, you know, the whole business of, of private health insurance is not up to dealing with the kinds of problems that we have. So I'm all in favor of, 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 of a single payer system. Uh, but uh, a single payer system is not itself adequate to deal with a public health crisis. You need to have you need to have the capacity to mobilize the population uh, to um, to handle you know all of the kinds of behavioral changes and uh, protective measures that are necessary. Uh, yes. and some countries did. It's it, we, can, we can see that some countries did it, mm -hmm. uh, and what and what they got for it what they got was was you know fatality rates that were in the hundreds or the low thousands, right. not five hundred thousand. And, and, and populations if, in the event that you were what we call a fiscal hawk, they locked down and their economies came back sooner. Correct. And so the need for fiscal stimulus was of less depth and shorter duration. That's, that's absolutely correct. I mean, they, they realized that if you de dealt with the public health problem, you can get the economy back. We got the worst. We, we stalled. And it's an exponential process. It's, mm -hmm. you know, the thing that's multiplies right. it. So the, the, a few days, a few weeks, and you are in very deep trouble because it moves very fast on you. So you have to move quickly. You have to move in an uncompromising way. Uh, and then you've got the benefit that you grow out of it much sooner. Uh, that's, mm -hmm. I, I think that's, that, that's a, a clear 
a clear lesson that even an economist can can absorb. What what has surprised you? What have you been pleasantly surprised by? What have you been haunted by? What do you wish you were seeing in light of all the challenges that sit before us now? Well, uh, an economist is not normally pleasantly surprised by anything because the, the discipline focuses no one's attention yeah. <laughs> on, 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 on the real problems. Uh, and this is a very interesting time to be an economist if you have your eyes open and if your brain is still functioning, which is unfortunately the minority uh, situation in the field. Uh, mm. But uh, if you go back a dozen years, uh, the period that we're living through, that we started living through really with the onset of the, of the great financial crisis uh, in 2007, uh, is one which ought to be revolutionizing finally uh, the entire field uh, because it is a series of, uh, of, of developments uh, w for which the approaches that have been dominant for a generation or more uh, are completely inadequate. Uh, they were inadequate to, to either anticipate or to deal with uh, the financial meltdown uh, as they didn't incorporate uh, the uh, critical perspectives that go back to Keynes and Minsky uh, on, on, on those questions. Uh, they did not uh, and have not um, been uh, an eff effective or useful in confronting uh, climate change because they do not incorporate uh, the kinds of uh, the, the basically the basic uh, 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 physics and biophysics of resources uh, and uh, uh, and um, the and, and the capacity of the environment to absorb emissions, uh, which are fundamental. Uh, which are you know, raised in the early 1970s by Nicholas Georgescu Regan and uh, mm -hmm. simply never, never uh, penetrated into mainstream economic discourse. Um, and they uh, have, I think, utterly misrepresented the role of markets as against organizations and regulation in a society. So this is an area where, where my father's work over many years uh, is relevant. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, again, we have uh, uh, a, an economics profession which has basically laid aside the work of almost all of the truly important people of the previous period uh, and finds, it, finds itself incapable of dealing with, uh, with the crucial questions that, we're, uh, that we actually face. Yeah, yeah. So vis-a-vis, -vis, uh, how would I say? the Trump administration and then the follow on the Biden administration here in the mm -hmm. United States. Do you see Trump as a coincidence, an aberration, or did he somehow organically arise from the pressures and the despair that were going on in the economy? Yeah, I, well, I think it's clear that, that Trump himself was a symptom of developments that have been a long time, uh, mm -hmm. a long time in the, in the works. Uh, one way to look at this is that uh, at the start of our careers, when we were both on uh, on Capitol Hill, uh, mm -hmm. mid 70s to the mid 80s in my case, uh, yeah. this was a crucial moment uh, when the United States made a decision uh, through the implementation of monetary policy, that, through what Paul Volcker and Ronald Reagan did, uh, to sacrifice its industrial uh, heartland to its financial sector. Uh, and what grew up out of that was an economy which is prosperous on on the East Coast uh, as a result of the uh, basically the the power the global power of the financial sector, prosperous on the West Coast as a result of the uh, the development of advanced technology and uh, and a, a number of other things aerospace and uh, information aerospace entertainment on the West Coast. Uh, mm -hmm. And in between, uh, in, in, in grave difficulty, and particularly the Midwest, the upper Midwest, the heartland, uh, has uh, simply not uh, effectively recovered uh, from, the, uh, uh, from, from that transition in the early 1980s. Uh, and the result of that is, of course, uh, uh, people who are now, who were once working in, uh, uh, in that part of the country and are now probably mostly fairly elderly, uh, and uh, many others are very, very uh, disenchanted, uh, yes. and they were open. They were open to Donald Trump's uh, appeal, which uh, had an enormous amount of myth associated with it, 
Uh, but uh, the reason Trump was elected was that he was able uh, to uh, bring over uh, a fair number of people who said to themselves, well, he's at least he's saying things that we understand that uh, the Democratic Party is not saying, and he is uh, rejecting things that the Democratic Party uh, has uh, perpetrated, including, of course, yes. trading agreements and, and everything else from this period. It's not entirely fair to the Democrats because it really goes back to Reagan, but uh, yeah. it was a real phenomenon. Trump was the outcome of it, not the, not, not the progenitor. Yeah, and he, I remember saying, the system is rigged. It was like his mantra, the system is rigged. And everybody said, oh, I haven't heard that in a long time. People forget he beat 15 Republicans before. Yeah, I, haven't, I haven't forgotten that. But, but, and uh, I'll never forget a gentleman <laughs> who uh, has the Dilbert cartoon, Scott Adams, mm -hmm. wrote a blog post and gave a speech one time about how I took all these classes on hypnosis and learning and communications and he and Steve Jobs were friends and watch out for this guy Trump. And about a month mm -hmm. after finding that quizzical kind of, you know, wow, Donald Trump, or, this guy really thinks he's serious. I watched him in Florida, panel of 16 guys sitting next to Jeb Bush. And Jeb Bush said something, we criticized Trump and everybody cheered. And Trump said something back and everybody booed. And Trump looked at the TV camera and he said, ladies and gentlemen, you may think Jeb Bush was a popular governor here and he was, and that's for some of the cheering. But what you got to understand is those people cheering and booing at this debate, they are the donors. Those are the people who are rigging the game here. Those are the Republicans who are getting paid for their support in politics. Those are the people you and I have to defeat. And I just sat back and I said, wow, this guy wants the nomination for president and he just took on the RNC about oh, the donors, yeah. I said, this is a different cut of fish. He is breaking away from what I'll pay. Well, there was no question they did. I think, I mean, I mean we're now in, in 2021, and I think well, yeah. Donald Trump is, my view is a spent political force. Yes. Uh, that uh, the, yes, the general collapse that occurred over the last year uh, has uh, you know, drained the the aura that surrounded That's him right. and the, right. the the extraordinary uh, upheaval in in January uh, has got to have caused ev you know reflection even amongst some of his most dedicated backers. Uh, but the underlying issues there are were were real, and uh, of course he yeah. took a certain amount of political talent, which was authentic, to exploit them. Yeah. We're now in a new phase. Uh, right, now, right. now, well, now climate change. Was coming on stream as he was deregulating mm -hmm. and defying the Paris Accord, and secondly, his tax cuts and deregulation were really what you might call a, a seduce and abandon, a bait and switch vis-a-vis -vis the people he inspired to vote for him. Oh yeah, I'm not so sure. I I, I think what happened, if you look at the at the uh, broad aggregates, uh, was that there was a slow, steady. Uh, highly inertial expansion that began uh, after the after the financial crisis in 2009, yes. Yes. and it continued at about that same pace. If it was losing sp steam early in the Trump term, it was probably sustained to a degree by the by the tax cuts, mm -hmm. and that carried on until the early part of 2020 when the pandemic crushed it. Yes, sir. Uh, and so, yes, sir. Uh, you know, the the. Um, uh, the the, the the important thing though is 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 not there. It's that a uh, the the formula that Trump uh, offered no longer carries any conviction. Mm -hmm. uh, nobody believes that uh, they we're going to have uh, a successful uh, development uh, of the economy from that foundation, mm -hmm. uh, and nobody believes that we're going to have a successful development from what came before. Right? Nobody, this, yes, this, yes. The, everybody understands that the reason we got Trump was that the uh, in the Obama administration uh, there was a kind of half-hearted, uh, insufficient uh, approach to a serious problem. There was not a structural approach, and and of course, if there had been, it would have been there wasn't the political capacity to get it enacted. Uh, so the fact that the uh, you know the, the Obama people pulled their punches. Uh, has created a situation which surprises me, uh, in which President Biden uh, 
has a, a margin of maneuver and a conviction about what needs to be done, uh, that shows that he really did live through this period and, and, and remembers it, uh, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. to me is very much to his credit, because we're now seeing, even from some of the same people, uh, a very different uh, approach. They're, they're saying, in effect, we have to put forward a program which is adequate to the challenges that we face. And we'll do it in two phases. We will get people through the pandemic with a very substantial program of income support and uh, support for state and local governments and this kind of thing. And then we'll move and we'll try and deal with, with the larger structural questions which are going to, uh, which, we're, which we're going to face. This to me is, it, it's a major breakthrough in thinking, at least for mm -hmm. Democrats. Yeah. Um, one of the things one remembers uh, and uh, again, it's, it's good to be uh, on the on this with a with a with a fellow um, geezer, uh, because we we're old enough to remember uh, that uh, in 1981, when Ronald Reagan uh, and his crew came in, they demanded the moon. Yeah. They 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 put put forward a tax cut, which was their major agenda, that was one third of the income tax, roughly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, and put forward, company. Yeah, the supply well, exactly. side. Yeah. yeah, no, they, that was that was that was froth. Murray Wiedenbaum, who was Reagan's economic yeah. chief economic advisor, said, you know, to friends, to liberal friends, he said, well, we're, we're really clever. We've got our Keynesian stimulus in place just before <laughs> the, our re-election. Uh, yeah. You know, they knew yeah. what they were doing. Yes. But the point was, they got a very big program through the Congress, plus a very big increase in the military budget. So it's a Keynesianism on both sides. And when it proved to be more than they needed, well, they, they were able to make some concessions, and you got tax increases in 82 and 84. That uh, were mm -hmm. actually very large by yeah, historical Graham standards. Graham Rudman Hollings and uh, well, uh, Defra and the, Tefra, yeah, yeah, the, 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 yeah, yeah. These, these two tax bills. Uh, and then ultimately the tax reform of 86. But the things that they did in, before he was reelected were substantial. Um, and, you know, they could give that back. So they looked, they, they won coming and going. Uh, that's a political lesson which Joe Biden is old enough and has been around long enough mm -hmm. to have recognized. And it really transformed things to have the Democrats playing this game, saying, we're going to go and, and do it. Uh, we're going to put the, the kitchen sink into this. We're going to put everything we have on the table. Uh, and, uh, you know, when we get it, if it turns out, I don't think there will be a problem, uh, frankly, uh, because the whole notion that there, we're in some kind of you know, inflation, inflation prone situation is absurd to my mind. But mm -hmm. uh, if there were such a problem, you can deal with it when the problem comes up. Deal with the problem that's in front of you and don't anticipate ones that might or might not emerge in three or four years. Right. That's, I mean, that's, that's the sense Especially when the pendulum of distribution, meaning profit share relative to labor share, the pendulum mm -hmm. is rocked so far in one direction that if you compressed profit, with wages coming up, it wouldn't necessarily lead to inflation for quite some time. Well, I mean, inflation is a, when prices are now set, and as they were not in the 1970s, on a worldwide basis, energy mm -hmm. prices, mm -hmm. prices for consumer goods come in from, uh, imported from the rest of the world, uh, food prices are, are the, the, this is a world market. Uh, so the ability of the United States to generate inflation is just much less. Uh, mm -hmm. And then back back in the day, uh, we had a, uh, a you know there was a dynamic of wages and prices as a result of uh, union wage settlements and the price of things like automobiles uh, that were affected by union wage settlements. And those those things are no longer major factors in the U.S. economy. So. Uh, and, and then, then there's the fact that almost all of our jobs are services jobs, and until yes. service workers don't have any 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 very much wage um, setting power, so right. it's just a different. It's a non-inflationary situation. Uh, the mm -hmm. one price that can go up is land, but land is not counted as in the price industry, so it's it's not going price land and stock values and so forth. But mm -hmm. those things are 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 uh, they don't they don't show up as part of the consumer price index anyway. So it, it's very very cr silly to be holding on to a model, uh, um, the so-called Phillips curve, that was generated 1960 in an entirely different world yeah. uh, than as, as a basis for thinking about how things are going to happen now. Well, you've been doing work, systematic work, for a very long yeah. time now on the questions of inequality. And 
I know it's very evidence-based, very mm -hmm. empirical. What kind of things have you seen change, say, since the time Bill Clinton came into power, 1992 to the present, which is 28 years? What, what's, yeah. what are the structures, like you mentioned, more service workers, more, uh, how do you say, price setting in the world economy, globalization, probably a deterioration of unions, but paint a picture for us. Uh, Okay, what's, so what's let's, going on let's start. Quality? Let's start with the United States and the and the, and the, the turning point that you uh, mentioned is a pretty good place to start. Uh, so what happened in that period was a bifurcation of the American economy, uh, and you can see it very clearly if you look at the data as we do by region or by sector. Uh, that uh, the stratospheric incomes that define American income inequality were generated in banking. Uh, they were generated in, in, in finance, generally speaking, uh, and they were generated in the technology sector, which was a creature of the financial sector. It was, mm -hmm. uh, and then how, how does that done? That is done through IPOs and through, uh, cap basically through capital asset valuations. And you look at this and you say, God, God, it's a small number of people with an amazing amount of income, and that's what inequality is. Uh, we did a calculation for the late 1990s uh, using uh, um, income recorded by county, that's tax data. Uh, and we found that if you took out five counties uh, that um, uh, from the data and pretended that what had happened there hadn't happened, the inequality across counties would, from eight, you know, in all those last years of the 1990s, would have fallen by half. Uh, right. Those five counties, big surprise. Well, what were they? They were where, where, where you may be sitting, New York, New York, yeah. All right. Uh, and then uh, uh, three counties in Northern California, San Francisco, Santa Clara and San Mateo, and one county in Washington State, King County, which is Microsoft. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's just extremely straightforward what was happening. And so probably Fairfield the, County in Connecticut, which was a commuter to New York. Yeah, that's in, the, that's in the top 15, I'm sure. Yeah, but, yeah. Uh, but at least five. You took out 15. It, it was basically the whole of it. Uh, you didn't yeah. get any increase. Yeah. in. Any, so what was happening was 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 enormously concentrated uh, um, capital asset um, uh, inflation, if you like. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then you can look at the pattern in later years. It differs uh, defense contractors and real estate and so forth, depending on what's going on. Uh, but, okay, so that's the United States, by and, by and large. A tremendous bifurcation as a result of the structural change in the economy, with most people working in the service sector just not seeing... Uh, you know, the, anything, not seeing much change, really, not seeing any great increases, uh, maybe not seeing enormous decreases either, but there are certainly the level of inequality went up dramatically. Okay. Mm -hmm. The bigger story is the world as a whole. Uh, and what we, uh, you know, were able to establish, and this is the real, I think, innovation and important aspect of our work, is that uh, the... Um, uh, you look at this uh, the pattern of evidence for the for countries around the world, and we have um, about 150 countries in the data set going back to the 60s, uh, and you can see that the pattern of rise of inequality is driven by global finance. It's uh, you can see this in um, uh, in the early 1980s, inequality goes up in the countries that are hit by the by the debt crisis. Late 1980s, early 1990s, it's the countries of the formerly socialist bloc that were collapsing. Of course, inequality went up like a rocket there. Mm -hmm. And then in the 1990s onward, it's in Asia, which was going, they're going liberalization. So where countries liberalized, where they were exposed to international finance, where they were hit by debt crises, inequality goes up. Uh, and in the, after 2000, there's at least a pause of 12, 15 years uh, because a lot of countries retreated from the neoliberal model and they had strong commodity prices. So you can see this as basically a global macroeconomic phenomenon. And that's, that's, that's the, the interesting thing because if you ask what the literature says about inequality, it's all about labor markets. It's all about technology, education, trade in one specific place and some other specific place. Uh, and they never tie the story together to show a pattern that's, that's determined across large regions, continents, or the world as a whole. But frankly, inequality is generated at the level of the world as a whole. And that then comes back to my uh, basic view, which is that you know, if, you've, if you don't start your analysis of the uh, world from a standpoint of a 
essentially monetary analysis rooted in Keynes, uh, they're not going to understand very much. Yeah. And Hyman Minsky, how would Minsky I say, answer. had been prescient sure. in that Keynesian kind of way, innovative sure. himself, and wasn't really recognized until it was it had fully blossomed. Then people acknowledged his brilliance much more. They, they, they've acknowledged it, but uh, the, the question the, the question I would ask is. Uh, going again, going back to the to the financial crisis, it's been 13 years. How many of the people who were right about this, who had the right methodological perspective and who you know warned in advance that the financial system was unstable, how many of them have been given appointments at the so-called top economics departments? The answer is zero. They haven't done it. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, a few people who are already there occasionally give kind of a lip service nod. But frankly, the, people, the jobs still go to people who were, who were wrong before and who are, uh, you know, essentially clueless about what's going on now. Well, thank you. And uh, let's uh, sign off and we'll come back again in a few months and take the temperature again. But I appreciate your okay. time today and uh, try to stay warm down there in Texas.